Hello, everyone. Now we'll have a space, space and microgravity research panel. Um, we have Stephen Collicott, who is a professor at Purdue University in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. We have Jeffrey Mamber, who is currently the managing director of NanoRacks. And we have Will Pomerantz, who is currently the vice president at Urgent Galactic. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Will Pomerantz. I'm Vice President for Special Projects at Virgin Galactic. I am a native of Buffalo, New York, although I moved away a long time ago, so uh, happy to be back here. I'm also a SEDS alum. I ran the chapter when I was an undergrad. I think this is my fifth space vision in a row and six total, something like that. So uh, I always have a lot of fun speaking at these conferences, mainly because of the great questions that I get during my presentations, as well as the great conversations that happen after, after hours. I say that by way of encouraging you, please, to. Uh, Feel free to interrupt my talk with questions, and I think we're all going to try and reserve some time at the end. I forgot to stop and start my clock. Reserve some, a fair amount of time at the end for you to ask questions of, of any of the three of us. Maybe for us to ask each other questions if we have them. Um, you heard, if, uh, if any of you were here for the previous presentation, Krista Christensen, who I like to call the Nate Silver of the space community, was talking about projections for what the uh, suborbital market will look like over the next decade. And she was talking about the fact that even though most people call this market space tourism, uh, and even though that's perhaps the biggest single factor, it's not the only factor. Um, research is a big part of why we all got into this business. It's a big part of how um, firms like mine are going to make our money. And it's a big part about why I find this an inspiring industry to work in. Um, you know, this isn't the banking industry. This isn't something else where perhaps I can make money uh, more quickly. Uh, or certainly in larger quantities. It's something that I really believe is fundamentally important in addition to being pretty awesome to talk about at parties. Uh, it's a nice mess. Um, my background is I, I actually, my undergraduate degree is in planetary sciences uh, and I am not a planetary scientist today, you will observe. The main reason why I'm not is I found it incredibly frustrating how hard it was to do original experimentation in that field. In planetary science, you are pretty lucky if you get to work on a new mission every decade of your career. Uh, and heaven forbid that mission gets canceled or the launch vehicle doesn't do what you want the launch vehicle to do or any of a million other accidents that are completely out of your control happen. And the data that you are basing your thesis on or your career on or your tenure on may have just evaporated overnight. I found that frustrating. I have the greatest admiration for people who stuck it out where I couldn't. Um, but I think that there are probably a lot of people, and maybe some of them are sitting in this audience, who have some of the same thought process that I did. Uh, and you're frustrated whether you are an engineer or a scientist or a mathematician or any of these other fields, you're frustrated by the, frustrated by the lack of opportunities. It occurs to me, um, you, you've heard a few times today that the total number of people who have been to space is about 500, 528, I think, to be precise. Um, you know, if there had only ever been 528 petri dishes invented or built, we wouldn't have done a whole lot in medicine. It, you could make that same analogy in a lot of other fields. We have just not had enough of a chance to do original experimentation. Uh, and I think that the future, the coming decade, offers some real promise to change that. It's going to happen in a number of different ways. Now, a quick background to, to Virgin Galactic for any of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, hopefully, you've at least seen a picture, if not a video, of that vehicle. Okay, it's still on your screen. This one keeps flickering on and off. Uh, that's called Spaceship One. This was the first privately built vehicle to carry human beings into space. It did it three times in the uh, summer and the fall of 2004. Uh, the thing that excites me most about this vehicle is that not only was it built by a small team, uh, sort of uh, on the order of uh, 100 or 125 person years to build this vehicle, but it was extremely cheap to build and even cheaper to fly. Uh, this vehicle went from a drawing and a napkin to hanging in the Smithsonian for about $27 million. Uh, and it flew three times, which means the cost of the repeated flights, which happened as quickly as five or six days apart, uh, instead of being hundreds and thousands of person days and person months of work, which adds up a lot of cost, humans are expensive, they're the most expensive thing in the space industry, uh, the cost to, to get this vehicle flying again was a few person days or a few person hours of labor. It meant that once we've paid for the cost of building the vehicle, you can offer a ticket to fly something to space or someone to space. And you don't have to charge very much for it because it doesn't cost you very much. Um, so that's why this vehicle is so, so important. Um, that was called Spaceship One. My company, Spaceship, uh, my company, Virgin Galactic, we licensed the technology that went into Spaceship One. We are building, and our partners at Scale Composites are building Spaceship Two. 
It is the larger, more glamorous version of Spaceship One, but it flies the identical mission profile. I won't dwell on it too long because I think most of you are familiar with it already. But we are an air launch system. We uh, are carried aloft to about 50,000 feet uh, by our mothership, the White Knight Two. Released from there, we fire up our rocket engine, and that takes us up to an apogee of just over 100 kilometers. So we're above the Kármán line, we are in space. If you're on board, you will earn your astronaut wings. Um, but more relevantly to this panel, if you are an engineer or a researcher or a scientist who has built an experiment, your experiment will get something on the order of four minutes of exposure to, uh, to microgravity. You, we have a dozen windows in the back of the vehicle. Uh, there is a picture of the real vehicles there. You see both the mothership and the, uh, and the spaceship. The mothership is sort of like a catamaran. It's a dual fuselage aircraft, so that's the two outer fuselages. The spaceship is the one in between. Uh, you can kind of see more on the uh, more on the mothership there than you can on the spaceship. The, the the large windows. So if you want to look out, if your uh, if your experiment has to do with looking down onto the Earth or looking out about to the limb of the Earth or out into the black of space, you can do that as well. Uh, and then we have uh, this. Just to click back to the last slide, if, if this works, we have this special reentry mechanism. I'm happy to talk more about in the Q and A uh, called feathering, uh, which allows us to come back home safely. And, and perhaps quite importantly. Um, this whole flight takes somewhere on the order of an hour and a half or two hours, um, which is pretty brief. And, and that's actually quite important for a variety of experimenters, especially people who are dealing in the life sciences. Uh, having an experiment that you have to load onto a launch vehicle three or four months before it's going to fly, and that you don't see again until several days or weeks or months after it's been off the ground, really limits a lot of the science that, that people can do, a lot of the research that people can do. This vehicle, by contrast, if you're a human being, if you're a tourist, you walk onto the vehicle right before flight, you walk off the vehicle right after flight, and if you're a researcher, you get to do the same thing. You get to either, if you're on board, you are the experiment, obviously, you do exactly the same thing. If you put your experiment on board, um, you can get on, get on board and get it pretty quickly. Uh, we're in our flight test program right now. Uh, the mothership has essentially completed her test flight program. She's got, I think, 103 or 104 test flights under her belt now. Uh, we haven't formally put the, uh, the approved stamp on it, but, but we're sort of just shy of doing that. The spaceship is the younger of the two vehicles, so still going through her flight test program, but has just completed the subsonic flight test program uh, and has performed admirably in all of those. So we are now preparing for our first uh, powered flights, which will be our first supersonic flights. You can see here a photograph of our propulsion system. Uh, which again, I'm happy to elaborate on in questions, but isn't really the focus of, of this panel. Uh, I will sort of skip through a few of these, just sort of clicking off some of the other milestones that we have. We have our pilots, we have our experimental permits. Uh, our commercial operations will happen out of Spaceport America in southern New Mexico. That will be where, our, uh, again, as I said, all of our first commercial flights happen. A lot of our test flights, or all of our test flights, uh, will happen out of the Mojave Air and Spaceport in Southern California. I know several of you heard Karina speaking about that uh, earlier today. So just to sort of rehash some of the uh, some of the capabilities of the vehicle here, it is, as I think I mentioned, an eight-seater, uh, unlike Spaceship One, which was nominally a three-seater that only ever actually flew with a single person on board. We have two pilots up front, and then the space in the back for either six tourists, or we can pull out those seats and we can put in uh, research racks uh, and fly an equivalent mass and volume uh, of, of research experimentation. You see the cabin dimensions here. It's fairly similar to, uh, to a small business jet. Uh, and we do have those uh, those dozen windows. We uh, we have also relatively gentle um, gravity loads uh, relative to, to most other space vehicles. Now I talked a, a little bit. I mentioned that we could pull out the seats and put in a rack system. And I want to thank Jeff, one of my fellow panelists here, whose company Nanoracks are designing our payload mounting system for us and doing a fantastic job. Um, one of the reasons that we chose Nanoracks and, and chose Jeff's uh, colleagues is uh, we did not want to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you are a researcher, as I hope a lot of you are or will become, uh, we want you to spend all of your time worrying about your experiment and none of your time worrying about how to bolt your experiment into the vehicle. Let us worry about that. Let Jeff worry about that. Uh, and especially since a number of you, like some of my other fellow panelists here and Dr. Collicutt, have probably built experiments that have flown on other vehicles. So if I can take something, you can literally pull off a shelf because you've already flown it on a parabolic flight aircraft or a sounding rocket or all the way up to the International Space Station, and you can just slot that into our vehicle and know that it's going to work. Um, that saved you a lot of time, it saved you a lot of money, and it's going to make it more likely that you're going to come and fly with us. Uh, so we are now uh, already dealing with several of these customers who are interested in flying their payloads. I'm happy to have one of them up on stage. Um, there are a number of other uh, universities, nonprofits, and for-profit profit research organizations. We've only just begun figuring out 
what exactly it is we have to offer to those, and so we're grateful for, uh, for the guidance that we get from Dr. Collicutt and others who tell us how to offer the right system uh, at, at the right price so that the research community will use it. But the main thing that I want to talk to you about in the remainder of my time is how you in the audience can get your payloads flown to space. Now, uh, can we just do a quick show of hands? How many of you are scientists? All right, not very many. How many of, our, of you are engineers? Almost everyone, okay. Uh, of, of you, whether you're scientist, engineer, or other, how many of you have um, published a paper? All right, how many of you have conducted an experiment that you helped design, whether you were the science side or the engineering side of that? Okay, a reasonable number. How many of you have done that in space? Okay. By the time I'm coming to this conference in a few years, I want to get to the point where all of you raise your hands on that. Because uh, that's what it should be. And that is something that, um, for all the, the fact that, that people and generations older than you may brag that they got to work on Apollo and they got to work on Space Shuttle and you didn't, uh, this is your answer to that. You are the first generation where I think it is entirely feasible that you could, within the course of a single school year, certainly within the course of a graduate degree, even a master's degree, come up with an original experiment idea, build it yourself, fly it, and get the data back. That's really exciting. That's really exciting to you, hopefully, because it means that it's a lot easier to do a cool thesis, get a degree that you're really proud of, and you can talk to your family about that. It will get you a really good job, whether you want to stay in academia or move out into industry. But it's also really exciting for me, because I think of all the wonderful and creative things that you're going to do. What happens when all of a sudden the scientific industry doesn't just have 500 Petri dishes, they have 5,000 or 5 million? This could happen. It's realistic. Um, there is a program that is starting to make this happen right now. It's called NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. They have already bought flights. They've chartered a full flight from us with options for several more. And it's not just by any means limited to our vehicle. They've also chartered flights on several other vehicles, on mass and space systems, um, on uh, up aerospace, on near space corp. They're, they're getting ready, I hope, to uh, charter some additional flights. So there's now a wide variety of vehicles on which NASA has bought flights, has paid for tickets, and they are giving them away to qualified applicants. Uh, and I will be honest with you, they are not getting enough qualified applications. So if any of you would like to, uh, to, to do experiments in space, which I can pretty much guarantee will get you extra credit in Dr. Collicutt's class, uh, apply for this program. I'm deadly serious. There is no reason why a student-run program couldn't win. In fact, uh, I gave a similar remark last year, and a student-run program was selected, at least one that I'm aware of, and I don't even know all the ones that have been selected. So uh, hopefully you are taking this to heart. I really want to hear you uh, about, about how you've applied for this. Uh, here's a suggestion. I'm sure you all have a million ideas, but talk to your friends and roommates who aren't doing space. Maybe you have a roommate who is a biologist who's doing a cool experiment. Chances are about a billion to one that experiment has not been done in space. Copy out their experiment. <laughs> Add in space at the end of every sentence. You've got the basis of a pretty healthy application. I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Now, this program in specific right now is not doing science, it's doing engineering, although sometimes you can sort of sneak in science into the rubric of engineering. What they want is to show new types of experimentation that can be done in space. That's why my joke earlier is so true. If no one has ever done X-ray crystallography or something like that in space, and you can show, I think we could do it in space, I think we could do it safely, I think we could do it affordably, and here's my method to test how, they will absolutely accept that kind of application. Absolutely. No questions about it. And you could be flying your payload to space, you could be flying on a parabolic flight aircraft, you could fly it on a balloon, you could do all of those things, and then now that's your pathway to fly something up to the International Space Station like Jeff is going to talk about later. Uh, how cool would that be? It's, it's Carl Sagan day today. Uh, Dr. Sagan published his first paper when he was 23. So maybe set that for a goal for yourselves. P publish your first paper by the time you're 23. Looks at, just from looking at the audience, most of you have a few years left until you hit that milestone. And make your first paper about an experiment that you designed and flew into space. Uh, you're gonna get into the grad school of your choice and you're gonna get the job of your choice. Whenever I, I, I had the privilege of hiring a lot of young men and women in my company, uh, I've hired SEDS alums in the past. Uh, if you have built something and flown it to space, that is the best thing that you can put on your resume by miles and miles, of, uh, way ahead of anything else. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll leave it with that. Uh, I'll just very quickly say we now also have an orbital launch vehicle, Launcher One, and uh, I'm really excited about it, but it's not the, the focus of this thing, so happy to do questions and answers later. Uh, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there. And should we do individual Q&A or just keep it all for the end? Keep it all for the end. Keep it for the end.
Yeah, so, we'll, so if you can hold your questions, write them down. Uh, we'll do question and answers at the end. And I'll yield to whichever of you would like to go next. All right, perfect. Hi, it's nice to be here. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I, I will immediately uh, correct Will that uh, what he says will not get you extra credit in my class. That's uh, standard practice in my class at Purdue Aero 418 Zero Gravity Flight Experiment. So freshmen and sophomores in the room, you might think of transferring juniors and seniors. Sorry, it's probably too late for you. Um, so Purdue's a great place. I've been there 22 years, School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, um, certainly one of the largest and best known. Um, aerospace engineering schools uh, in the world. Uh, we're living now in a beautiful new uh, Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering. He was one of our alums, as was the most recent man on the moon and 21 other uh, astronauts. So let's see, did you take the, oh, here it is. Anybody's guess? Yes, the right way. So at Purdue, besides what I do, there's a lot of um, other activities I've listed here. Uh, Professor Mudawar in mechanical engineering does uh, flow boiling work in uh, zero G. Uh, Professor Kerry Mitchell over in, uh, I'll get it wrong, it's horticulture or something like that, uh, has spent a lot of years uh, working on problems in plant and biomass growth uh, in space, uh, obviously in support of a uh, long duration uh, human space flight. Professor Ron Hollinger um, in veterinary anatomy uh, really led the way for Purdue with many experiments in the Mir and Shuttle years in avian uh, embryology, Japanese quail and uh, chickens. Um, Professor Chow, Lee Chow, she's a colleague of mine in aerospace. She does, uh, her thesis work was in low gravity, uh, microgravity combustion, and she still has an interest in that. Me, there I show you, I've done aircraft experiments, rocket experiments, drop tower experiments, balloon we're working on, and uh, space station experiments. And uh, my, my own field is generally uh, two-phase flows, liquids and gases together. If the vessel or the fuel tank is all liquid or all gas, it's, it's boring, okay? It's when they get together that the problems start. Uh, it's called job security for research, right? So um, zero G activities of our students, I, I love to brag about. Um, I'm building my second drop tower at Purdue. Uh, both have uh, uh, been used uh, by students or in, in thesis work. Uh, parabolic aircraft flight experiments with NASA, the really neat uh, British Gravity Student Flight Opportunities Program. Um, I've uh, led 30 teams in that. Purdue's had something like 41 teams uh, in that. It's, it's probably, I think, uh, some of the most effective education money spent at NASA. We, my students, my undergraduates, uh, design, build, and fly automated experiments on a commercial suborbital rocket uh, test flights. I'll show you a little bit of that. We launched most recently last weekend. Um, unfortunately, I had to be at some other conference, and so I didn't get to go to the launch. I sent my students, and they delivered very nicely uh, on that. Uh, and in July of this year, um, jointly with North Carolina Ag and Tech State University, uh, we were selected, the, the two of us together, a joint proposal uh, to design, build, deliver, and perform an undergraduate experiment in space station. Um, and we're in the process now of being scheduled into a uh, an increment or two and, and then a launch. So it's going to be uh, really fun. It really uh, doubled my teaching load this semester quickly, but it's exciting work, uh, very exciting work to be involved in. So here's some of my students. Many of you have, uh, have done this. Uh, your schools have done this too. Um, here we are with Armadillo. This was uh, October 6th at uh, Spaceport America. We don't get to use that beautiful new building. Will showed you uh, with Armadillo. We're at the low rent end of uh, Spaceport America. There's dirt roads, there's uh, dried sticks holding up the wire fence. Um, um, I don't know, I keep asking, well, there's got to be a Starbucks in the terminal, right? Can't I go up there? <laughs> Every terminal has a Starbucks. Um, so this is um, the Stig B rocket after its uh, flight on October 6th. We, that was our fifth launch um, that, that we had there. Um, it didn't reach the uh, intended altitude. You can read about that in a press release at um, New Mexico Spaceport America or uh, Armadillo's uh, News. Um, our experiment was returned safely. Obviously, that rocket's in very nice shape, uh, even for an aborted launch. There we are um, at, uh, before that launch. Um, uh, three undergrads and I uh, at the bottom 
uh, at the launch pad. This is uh, just before fueling. Once they start fueling, we have to get away. So this is kind of the last uh, safe minute uh, near the pad. Um, our little logo there with the uh, widget, the armadillo's uh, armadillo, uh, right. Um, and our Astro logo in back, and you see Spear underneath. That's uh, students at Purdue experimenting on armadillo rockets. So Spear 6 launched uh, Saturday. Um, but we're also, the students now working, um, like I said, Purdue and NCAT, our students' work is going to be right up there. This is astronaut uh, Sunitra Williams uh, operating the vein gap experiment in the capillary fluids experiment suite of, uh, of payloads. I had the great pleasure of uh, designing uh, that, that hardware there, and, or the science in that hardware, um, with uh, Professor Mark Weisslow at Portland State University. He was the uh, principal investigator on that. Um, very satisfying uh, uh, multi-year program, and uh, the astronauts uh, working for us up there were all just really superior uh, collaborators and uh, the, uh, really great to work with. And that was very exciting there. And so our undergrads' work is going to be up there um, 2014 or 2015. Um, it's very exciting to me. Matter of fact, now if something comes up on campus and uh, maybe I've got a disagreement with somebody, I find myself thinking, yeah, I don't care. I'm PI on a space station experiment. You know, <laughs> go ahead, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. This is very satisfying to me. Um, here is a movie from uh, the flight a week ago. This is a capillary uh, stability experiment. Yes, it's bubbling air through water, but there is uh, some science in it. Uh, the flight, uh, you can read online, the flight was aborted during ascent. ascent. Um, so this is kind of partial data, but you know, we're able to trigger the experiment, operate the experiment, get the data back. Uh, and so we are, uh, we feel really ready to go. We being myself and I have a team of uh, about 24 students in this class, uh, 20 students in this class, so it's, um, we're ready to go and uh, hopefully we'll be back uh, shortly with Armadillo to get, uh, to get a, a, uh, another launch attempt. So that's all, that's uh, student built hardware in there. If you want to scale, that's uh, between, the, uh, between the vertical bars you see is about two inches, okay? It fits a shoebox. Um, you know, Carissa introduced this great. Um, Will mentioned it too. Um, commercial suborbital is not just for tourists, it's for research. Uh, it's looking like three minutes in zero G for under a thousand pretty soon. That's remarkable. For comparison, it's hard to get an exact full number, but talking to researchers here and in Europe, um, a NASA sounding rocket or ESA sounding rocket. Um, Experiment, build, test, manpower involved with all this, integration, launch, it's approaching, it's on the order of two million. Uh, and so this is going to be really cool. It's going to be better zero G than the parabolic aircraft flight simply because you're up out of most of the atmosphere, okay? So there's Armadillo, X-Core, Mastin, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and Up Aerospace. Uh, once they get their de-spinning uh, working, are all going to be uh, players in this. And this really opens up a lot of opportunities, universities, even high schools, right? Five pound experiment for $5,000, all right? That's less than a new suit of, less, less than you spend on new football uniforms at high school, okay? Um, I think we're going to see uh, this really open up access to space uh, to many people many earlier uh, than they thought. Being involved in a space flight experiment is not something you, dream about as a high school student, you work towards as a college student, and maybe 20 years down the road, you'll be involved with, you know, maybe you've got one detector on New Horizons instrument or something like that. Access to space experimentation is going to happen at a much younger age, and this, I think, is going to be very stimulating. Um, the final point I wanted to make there, oh yes, the Suborbital Applications Researchers Group, I'm part of that, it's, it's a uh, volunteer group of researchers working uh, with the Commercial Space Flight Federation really to advance, to advocate for science, science and engineering research use of these vehicles. Um, and um, Sarisha Bandlaw is here, Assistant Director of Commercial Space Flight Federation. Alex Saltman is here, Executive Director of Commercial Space Flight Federation. Uh, they and I would love for you to come to the uh, June 2013 Next Gen Suborbital Researchers Conference. You'll get to see Will there too, I bet. Um, but there's opportunities now and in the near future. Again, I, I keep pushing the, uh, the NASA aircraft uh, flight program for students. A wonderful program. If uh, you've got another year in college, go home now, 
find a professor that's interested. Um, if he or she's not interested, keep bugging them. That's how I got involved was uh, two students bugged me three times until I said yes, just to get them to stop bugging me. Um, that was in 97, and it's a wonderful program. Uh, NASA Flight Opportunities Program, we've heard about several times here. NASA Roses, for a very limited uh, group of science topics or opportunities. Uh, Jeff here will tell you all about NanoRack opportunities. Um, Space Florida just had a deadline for a, a program. I, I wasn't able to uh, figure out how to find time to participate. There's so much going on, you know. Uh, direct purchase of rides on, on rockets and whatnot. Space flight will no longer, in space flight research, microgravity as a laboratory will no longer be solely NASA. Okay, it is uh, going to be a commodity. Um, Virgin Galactic and X-Core flights are going to be like shrink wrapped hanging out a peg in the store and you'll say I'll take two of these and three of these and it's going to be really cool. Um, other opportunities, uh, I'm sorry, our screen blinks here. Drop towers at Glenn, Portland State and at Purdue. You can purchase uh, research flights on uh, parabolic aircraft flights direct from Zero G Corporation. And uh, anybody here from Europe? Uh, well, tell your friends, Professor Ricard Gonzalez in Barcelona uh, runs a class like mine at Purdue and he's a great guy to work with. Uh, taking advantage of ESA opportunities. Um, the, and the blink is not steady here, it comes and goes. Uh, so tomorrow's capabilities, again, automated suborbital payloads, even human-tended suborbital payloads uh, in the future on, on several of these companies. Other companies aren't building yet for people, which is a, maybe a smart choice at, for a business model, too. Learn more at the Next Gen Suborbital Researchers Conference. It's, it's in the Denver area. SpaceX has already chosen one major experiment to fly in orbit, and uh, I think it's safe to assume uh, many more will follow it with the ability to perhaps loiter in orbit for a while after dropping off supplies at space station or similar. And it's already difficult to be aware of all the opportunities. There's so much going on. And I'll just conclude with this that, you know, there's someday now there's going to be a student to come to my office and say, yeah, well, I flew in space for my master's degree. What, what can you offer for a PhD? That's, that's when we know we're really good really know we're there, okay? So thank you very much. You know, sometimes the, uh, the best panels are ones that don't really plan and coordinate beforehand. Because this is really, for me, this is really exciting. And you're seeing, you know, everything that we're talking about here is, is really finally, after for us a decade a longer of waiting, these opportunities are now reality. And everything we're talking about today is not that much in the future tense. Uh, Will and Virgin, you know, that's a little bit still in the future, but it's hardware. You see it, it's flying. The opportunities are there, the building. And uh, everything which uh, Purdue, they're flying, and everything we're doing at Nanoracks in just three short years. And I'm real happy to be here today, Friday, in Will's hometown, to be talking about uh, the opportunities of what we're doing at Nanoracks. And so it's really, it, it sort of hit me listening to the two of you uh, how much has changed and how quickly it has changed. Um, my name is Jeff Manber, I'm Managing Director of Nanoracks. And I think tomorrow I'm speaking about some of the things I've done in the past with the Russian space program and uh, Pan Am SAT and busting up the Intel SAT monopoly. So I'll, I'll save my background for uh, tomorrow. Right now at Nanoracks, uh, we, we started Nanoracks because in 2009 we realized that there were few people using the space station. And we really had this, extra we have this extraordinary platform the robustness of the station was clear to us in 2009. And just as everybody's saying up here today, we got together at Nanorax and said, how do you lower the cost to get to space? How do you make it so that you have the opportunities now? And at Nanorax, we believe that the next exciting breakthroughs are going to come lower and lower on the educational, you know, lower in, in age, lower in uh, just breaking open to cloud and uh, ideas. And so we wanted to come up with a way that you could use the International Space Station for a fraction of the cost. And we went to, uh, we went to NASA in 2009 and said, we have a, a deal for you. Uh, we'll put up our own hardware and we'll pay for it ourselves. We don't want any money from you if you just give us the opportunity and you let us market to whom we please. And NASA said yes. And so 
We put up, uh, we started with a, a couple of research platforms that were in the CubeSat form factor, and we call them nano labs. And we use the CubeSat form factor because everybody knows it around the world. And at NanoRax, we say we're all about standardization, miniaturization, and open source. And just like Will was saying with those 500 Petri dishes, we share that passionately at NanoRacks. We want to break open the opportunities. And if we can lower the cost as much as possible, we're confident, and we're showing it now, that we'll have 5,000 and 50,000 Petri dishes. We went operational in 2010 on the station uh, with our two research platforms. And uh, today, uh, we've flown 78 payloads in two years. Our customers include everything from the NIH, and now we're really happy NASA's coming in as a customer, and there's some uh, uh, AOs, announcement of opportunities on the street for biological. We're page 72, and that's the first time that uh, Nanorax has been part of a NASA announcement of opportunity. And in several months, there's going to be a mission of, oppo of opportunity, I think they call it, dedicated just to Nanorax. And so we're very, very excited by that. We've flown, uh, through our educational partners, 39 school districts. Uh, we've had um, 12 high schools have flown individually. And NASA says it's the first time in history that there's been national educational space programs STEM with no NASA funding. And we're very, very proud of that. And, and you see that if you, give, uh, if you give students and educational organizations the ability to design an experiment and fly it, as we were saying, in a year, they respond. Our prices start as low as about $15,000 for 30 days on the station with biologicals uh, passive, and it goes up to over $2 million. So it just depends on you know, who you are, what you want to do, and uh, this is indeed a very, very exciting time. And at Nanorax, we're already on the pathway for what we're all talking about here today to make sure that there's no reason why any student anywhere in the world cannot say, I want to do something on, in space and have that opportunity. We've also, right now in the station, we have two Israeli uh, high schools flying along with uh, about 21 uh, American schools and school districts. We've flown uh, some Saudi projects. Uh, we'll be announcing a Romanian project soon. Uh, we just, uh, I'll show some other things in a moment, but when we talk about how we've made things simpler at Nanorax, you don't really understand it until you know what the status quo is. So I put this slide in just as a little dig sort of at our <laughs> colleagues and friends at NASA. This is sort of the standard way to choose payloads to get to space. And at Nanorax, we don't have peer group review. It's, uh, I was at one meeting at Johnson Space Center and a woman said, how do you prioritize your payloads? And I said, well, when the check clears the bank, you go to the front of the line. <laughs> and, and, and so we just eliminate a lot of the, I mean, we can do that because it's not taxpayer money. And so, so it's different if you're using taxpayer money. But at Nanorax, it's all about uh, uh, running a commercial business and, uh, and making sure the customer is happy. Um, if this video turns on, let's see if it turns on. No, it is not. It's a, it's a, um, it's a wonderful um, video, just a minute long, of Don Pettit, an astronaut, uh, working with one of our nano labs. Oh, now he's showing. Okay, this is another video of our external platform program, uh, which is something new. I'll talk about in a moment once we see uh, the video. We're now going outside the station and uh, will be the first commercial company to have an external platform outside for much bigger payloads. This will be sensors, advanced satellite uh, systems, materials. Our first customers are ready to case the Center uh, for Advancement of Science and Space, and we'll soon be announcing uh, other uh, customers coming in. And so this is just some wonderful footage here of inside the space station. This is the uh, Japanese module. And this shows a little bit of our history. On the left is our research platforms. And on the right are the astronauts. I love that, just Don just holding up, showing it. That's a 2U nanorack, nanolab. And we're, we're all about plug and play. 
Just very simple, as simple as you can as you can make it. And that's what we've done inside the station. And I just love this shot. Now we're going to go outside. And there's some footage. We're going to be right over on the left. That's where our external platform is going to be. And you'll be able to go. No astronauts are required. No EVA. Uh, it's a robotic arm. And you'll be able to go out for between 30 and uh, 90 days. And this price range is uh, about a million and a half to two million. And what's extraordinary is you get your payload back, either through the Soyuz or Dragon with SpaceX. We've already returned three uh, payloads via the Soyuz. A few weeks ago, we became the first company to arrange for a satellite to be deployed uh, from the station. That was on behalf of our customer, which was a Vietnamese university. And so it's a, it's a very, very interesting time now, a wonderful time. If you're a student, there's no limit to what you can do in space. And I love the analogy of comparing it to the basketball uh, uniforms, uh, basketball. So uh, let me see. We all know. I'll, I'll see if I can go photo. If we can kill the video. Okay, so I'll just keep going here in the interest of time. So at, oh, anything, so at Nanorax, what we're doing is it's... it's absolute seamless ladder. As Will mentioned, we're really pleased and proud to be working with Virgin Galactic and designing their hardware racks. And what that means is you can design an experiment, use a, 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 a nano lab, have your suborbital experience, have it six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, get everything working, and then come on up to the space station. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you don't have to play with the hardware, just focus on your research. An exciting development, uh, we put out our first announcement of opportunity, like a real aerospace company at Nanorax. We offered a $2,000 prize if someone would develop an open source, low cost nano lab uh, that would allow anyone to be able to understand how to use the circuit boards, etc. We got several good proposals where people said to us, no, it will cost 50000 to do this. It will cost 100000 And some students at Singularity and Stanford came up with uh, Audu Lab, And uh, by January, we'll be able to say to people, using Virgin, using uh, the racks on station through NanoRacks, here's an off-the-shelf, open-source uh, nano lab. And so it's further lowering the cost to do research. And we're really excited about that. And okay, we did that already, external platform. Isn't this a fantastic picture? Everyone thinks this is Photoshop. The, this is the three satellites that were deployed several weeks ago from the station. The middle satellite is our customer. That's the Vietnamese satellite from FTP University. Just extraordinary picture. We've already signed up uh, four or five more organizations and companies to fly, but I just, I just love this picture. It's extraordinary. And, um, and that's about it. At uh, Nanorax, uh, the future is here today. We are committed to utilization. We have over 83 payloads now under contract and uh, waiting to fly in addition to the 70 we've flown. They're everything from high school to uh, uh, DOD projects. This is an extraordinary time. You have no excuse not to get involved in space. And, uh, and it's, 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 we're really excited about what's going to happen next. So thank you. Uh, so oh, we are only short of time, so we have time for only two questions. Anybody? Uh, Jeff and Will, in the, in the picture for Virgin, where you said uh, NanoRacks is building your hardware, it looked like almost a mid-deck locker size capability, or was that just the way the picture was? No, that, that's absolutely correct, and, and Jeff, correct me if you had anything to add, but uh, our basic rack system can fit four mid-deck locker or four mid-deck locker equivalents. We offer the MDL as a standard you can use or not required to use it. We can also accept uh, cargo transfer bags and some of the other existing standards, or if you have something custom built, there may be some expense associated with the safety uh, analysis of that, but you can fly that as well. And then when you said you're going to be able to do biologicals, Jeff, does that include uh, small mammals at all? No, we, we, uh, we've elect, at, at this point in time, we just don't have any reason to do okay. that. Yeah. Uh, just, I think the students need to know, in case you don't get to go to the presentation tomorrow Jeff is doing, J Jeff is the pioneer 
of commercial space operations. He was talking commercial space in the 80s. They all thought he was nuts. He was an early proponent of collaborative work with the Russians. He got a lot of flack from people, especially at NASA. And he is a great lesson for you all in perseverance and sticking to a dream. And then he translated that all, got past his, uh, uh, some of the ways he doesn't like the things NASA does, has gotten NASA to work with him to do this extraordinary stuff he is doing on ISS. And so just, you need to know who this fellow is. Um, my question is, what is the most like unique or interesting microgravity experiment you've heard of? Because I know there's a big range of different experiments you can do. Where should each do one? Yeah. Uh, I, there's, I, it's sort of, pick your favorite ice cream flavor, there's no right answer. The one that, uh, that I heard about recently that really excited me was someone doing 3D printing yeah. in, the, in zero or microgravity. I think that, just the mind boggles of what you could do with that. It's, it was sort of a simple idea, but they were the first ones to do it. I thought that was really great. I think for me, um, maybe it's within my specialty, and it kind of when I was first starting into the field, but there was a group uh, led by mathematicians, uh, uh, Finn and Conkus, uh, it's at uh, Stanford and Berkeley, who uh, showed that a uh, axisymmetric container um, such as this glass, um, may have, uh, when it's partially filled with liquid, uh, uh, may certainly have a uh, the lowest energy state uh, being asymmetric. And so this is a, a rude surprise in satellite fuel tanks if you don't anticipate it or in other uh, things like water air separation for life support systems. So to me that was, I, I think, the most uh, interesting or exotic one because it was a simple little piece of hardware and the implications of it or the impact of it um, is very broad. We have a uh, customer doing uh, uh, the first electroplating in space, which is going to reveal uh, some very fundamental things about materials. And what makes it so, and it's gotten the interest of NASA, and what makes it so interesting, it's the Valley Christian High School out of San Jose, California. So this is what we're saying about the uh, creativity and the breakthrough getting uh, younger and younger as the, the amount of opportunities increases. So even on its own, the electroplating in space would be interesting, but uh, we're just so, just we just love the fact that it's a high school in San Jose.